Welcome back to TOK's new sports edition. Here we give you play-by-plays of each way of knowing. What strategies does each side use to try and hit the other side out of the park? And in the end, we'll see whose argument touches down with the strongest points. The coin is flipped and our starter is... Emotion! Catherine, why did you kick off the first clip? Our starting lineup consists of Zach Walls, a supporter of same-sex marriage, followed by Pastor Charles L. Horley, a man with an anti-gay sermon. Well, let's see if Emotion's arguments are slam dunks. Um, you know, and I guess the point is that our family really isn't so different from any other Iowa family. You know, when I'm home, we go to church together, we eat dinner, we go on vacation. Here he's portraying himself as a normal family, and he's appealing to the emotions of all families. And by outlining all the normal family type things he does, he's trying to create empathy. Now that he's portrayed the family as being normal, he's bringing in more emotion to illustrate his point and to build even more empathy. The language used evokes emotion in that it has positive connotation and plays on the fact that as Americans, we believe everyone should be treated equally. Here he uses himself as an example of a child raised by gay parents and then appeals emotionally to the chairman by playing on the basis of parental pride. He focuses on the emotional aspects of family life by bringing in commitment and love, which is an emotion that most people have a strong response to. The word discrimination has a very negative connotation. This causes people to associate the proposed amendment with negative emotions and view it as a bad thing. He pulls the love card again and appeals to the sense of family. He also uses the phrase second class citizens which has negative connotations and implies that equality would be maintained by not passing the amendment. Of our president getting up and saying that it was all right for two women to marry or two men to marry, I tell you right now, I was disappointed bad, uh, but I tell you right there, as is sorry as you can get, the Bible's again it, God's again it, I'm again it, and if you've got any sense, you're again it. Here he is using a type of emotional fallacy called appeal to flattery, as failing to agree with him would mean that you don't have any sense. He also states that God is against it, which influences people who have a strong emotional tie to religion and God. Amen. I'm going to preach the hell out of all of us. Hey, I, I tell you right now, Somebody said, who are you going to vote for? I ain't going to vote for a baby killer and a homosexual lover. He appeals to emotion here by using phrases that have negative connotations and inspire negative emotions in people. He also uses logical fallacies, red herring, and ad hominem by bringing up a topic that isn't related to the argument and by attacking the president instead of focusing on the topic at hand. You said, did you mean to say that? You better believe I did. God have mercy. It makes me puke and sick. He expresses his strong emotional response to homosexuality and the words God have mercy influence people who have strong emotional ties to religion and imply that the act he is referring to is wrong. To think about... I don't even know whether you ought to say this in the pulpit or not. Could you imagine kissing some man? 
The pastor is manipulating people's emotions by putting them in a position that they already don't agree with, which strengthens their negative opinions on the subject. Wowza! Looks like there are some emotions being tossed around out there. Did one argument really knock out another? I'm gonna put a short stop on you right there. Let's tally up some scores after we see some logic arguments. Sounds like a fair game to me. The second half of this session consists of a musical put on by Myers Park alumni that approaches the amendment from a more logical standpoint, as well as a study that declares that heterosexual parents raise better families than homosexual parents. I'll bring in a guest reporter, Aaron Bacon, to help out with these clips. Hope the arguments are shaken, Bacon. Let's stop the shaking and start the rolling. Roll the clips. Several college students who are natives to Charlotte, North Carolina, created a musical to express their views on Amendment 1. In this six-minute long theatrical piece, they explain different arguments based on reason that are against the amendment. This is a strong compilation of several points of view based on reason, so we will analyze several clips. Here the couples present the argument that all couples in North Carolina need protection in the case of domestic violence. They are using reason to extend the 14th Amendment of the United States, which guarantees all citizens equal protection under the law, to say that all couples deserve equal protection. Amendment 1 uses the phrase domestic legal union, which eliminates all benefits and protection the state used to provide to non-married couples. These deal with child support, child guardianship, and protection from domestic violence, among other issues. Due to the amendment, only married couples will be allowed these benefits and protection. Now the couples acknowledge the knowledge problem of the phrasing of the amendment. As we said before, the phrase domestic legal union is used, a phrase which can cause confusion as to what the amendment actually does. By phrasing it this way, as we mentioned before, the amendment takes away benefits and protection from all unmarried couples. The couples in the musical are highlighting this issue. In this clip, George Washington makes an appearance to provide rebuttal to the commonly used argument that voting on Amendment 1 and voting on marriage is what the Founding Fathers would have wanted. It is an appeal to patriotism, and it presents an argument that makes you look non-democratic if you disagree, which is a logical fallacy. George Washington proposes that it is not fair to hold a vote that decides something for the minority of the population, because those affected are not going to have an equal say in their fate. The majority of those who are making the decision by voting are not affected by the amendment, and this can be seen as unfair. Finally, George Washington addresses the argument that traditional marriage is only between a man and a woman. He references the historical time when interracial marriage was considered taboo, and points out that this view on marriage has changed. Another marriage amendment to the North Carolina Constitution, added in 1875, actually made interracial marriage illegal, and it was later repealed in 1971 with a new constitution. The actors here are making the point that societal definitions of institutions like marriage change with the culture. So using the argument that traditional marriage should always be upheld is misguided because the definition of traditional marriage has already changed significantly throughout history. Fox News came out with a report a few years ago that claimed that studies that revealed that homosexual and heterosexual couples raise children with equal qualities are flawed. The article states that the studies are often invoked to erase fears about the developmental health and well-being of children raised by gay parents. 
The main arguments presented that go against gay marriage, based on a logical approach to raising children, are that reproduction is the core basis for marriage, but gay couples cannot produce offspring without science or adoption, and men and women are born with innate psychological differences, and children should be influenced by both. Gay men will not provide a traditional maternal role model, and gay women will not provide a traditional paternal role model. Those are both home runs! So now that we've seen all the arguments, which way of knowing is the winner? Should we use emotion or logic when making a moral decision about the amendment? So, let's settle this. I think we should use emotion for a moral decision. Yeah. Wait. Why? Well, emotion, it creates empathy. Like, we can connect to each other, and it's more personal. And also, it, like, focuses your attention, and it motivates action. Yeah, but what about the cons of emotion? I mean... It's not objective, but it can be manipulated. You know, personal prejudices can get in the way. Not groovy. Yeah. So, logic? Yeah. Logic's objective. It's reason-based. Totally groovy. There are cons to logic, too. It's just not personal, and it can lead to moral absolutism. Yeah. So, wait. You want logic. But you want emotion. Wait a second. We could do both! How? Well, if you use your emotions, you make the topic personal to you. And you can connect with others, and I mean, like, it motivates you, like she said. But a lot of times it causes you to, you know, like, obliterate your logic from your rationale, right? So, like, by using logic, too, you can also approach the topic objectively. So you can, like, analyze the topic so that all parties understand, not just you and your biased emotions. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, we're gonna forget all of this talk in the morning. Yeah. Wait. Why? Oh, I get it. Because we're all sort of high. <laughs> a concluding summary. Wait, can we film that last part? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just go from yours. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> you know, we're gonna forget all of this talk. Yeah. Wait. Why? Wow. Oh, I get it. Because, you know, we're all sort of...